warning, this video may make you want to buy some books. <laughs> that was just for you, Jenny. Welcome to the book nook. Today it is time for another haul, May Hall part one. Part one of a May Hall, I never really know the correct terminology or way to phrase it. Like I know how to type it, name the video, but anyway. First part of my haul for May is this video that you're watching. Well done, you made it this far. So the first one I am gonna haul is an unsolicited one that was sent to me, and that is The Reminders by Val Emich. Emich? Emich? Val Emich is an actor with numerous high-profile TV credits to his name and an award-winning singer-songwriter who's released over a dozen albums. It's so bad that I've never heard of him. Anyway, um, this book is... I'm just going to read the blurb for this one. Ten-year-old Joan was born with a rare gift. She can remember every single day of her life in perfect detail. She can tell you how many times her mother has uttered the phrase it never fails in the last six months, 27, or what she was wearing when her grandfather took her fishing on a particular Sunday in June years ago. Fox socks. But Joan doesn't want to be the girl who remembers everything. She wants to be the girl that no one can forget. When her father's old bandmate Gavin comes to stay, reeling from the sudden loss of his partner Sydney, Joan is keen to enlist his help in making her name, even if that means using her extraordinary memory to help him solve the mystery of Sydney's final months. So this one actually sounds really interesting. I like books that have got a bit of a musical slant in them, and um, it sounds like a really interesting story. So this is from... Where's the publisher? So this is from Picador, and Eidman has a quote from Eowyn Ivy on the back here, who adored the unlikely friendship between a gifted child who remembers everything and a grieving man who's trying to forget. Ten-year-old Jones says a good song should either make you want to dance or cry, and The Reminders does both. So, I'm quite keen to give this one a try. I was a bit confused when I saw the cover, I thought it was maybe a um, sort of non-fiction look at the Beatles. But it isn't. So yeah, I'm excited to give this one a try. Thank you very much, Picador. Let me just shut that window. Next up are the books that I bought so far this month. Now I've been better than I... Th no. I've been worse than I told myself I was going to be. I told myself I wasn't going to buy any more books in May. Considering that, I think I've been better than I could have been. Um, but still bought more than I should have done. So, oh well. Whoops. Shit happens. What are you going to do? So the first book I bought was Stasi Wolf by David Young. Now I have not read Stasi Child, but from what I can gather it doesn't seem to matter too much. It's not sort of like a series, I hope. It might be a sort of recurring detective. Um, but with all of these I think you can still read them on their own and their work as crime novels. And now I don't read masses of crime. You may have noticed so far on this channel that I haven't mentioned sort of many crime books. Um, it's never been a genre that I've been particularly not bothered about, not not unbothered about, hmm, what do I mean? It's not been a, hmm, what do I mean? I've never been a massive fan of sort of thrillers and stuff, not because I think they're bad, but just because it's not my cup of tea. I am a fan of sort of literary fiction and modern contemporary stuff, but having said that, I have read a few good crime books and this one piqued my interest. So East Germany, 1975, two infant twins have vanished from a city that's supposedly free of crime. Ober Lieutenant Karen Muller is drafted in from Berlin to take the case and rescue her own reputation. But amidst the eerie nameless streets, the Stasi insist she run the investigation without destroying the public's blissful ignorance of the danger lurking in the heart of their propaganda-filled community. And she must act fast because the child snatcher must not stop at two, or may not stop at two. I was good right until the last minute there. Um, so this one sounds quite intriguing. I've heard good things about it. And yeah, I, I like it that, you know, there's a lieutenant or a, a copper detective that's got to save their own reputation as well. Um, I really enjoyed recently um, Sirens by Joseph Knox, which again was a sort of detective with a bit of a bad reputation um, and trying to sort of save his own career through this case. So um, not saying there's going to be sort of much similarity between the two. I don't know, but that's something that I liked. So I like that. And I really quite like the cover. You know me, my covers. Next up, for someone who's just said she doesn't read that much crime and doesn't buy much crime, I bought another crime novel, The Crow Girl by Eric Axel Sund. Now, from what I can remember, Eric Axel Sund is actually two people. Pseudonym for two authors who've been friends and collaborators for years, Jerka Eriksson and Hakan Alexander Sundquist. So, uh, yeah, I'm always quite interested by books with sort of dual authors and how that works in the writing process and things like that, so I'm quite intrigued. Um, so it starts with just one body, the hands bound, the skin covered in marks. Detective Superintendent Jeanette Kilberg is determined to find out who's responsible, despite opposition from her superiors. When two more bodies are discovered, it becomes clear she is hunting a serial killer. 
With her career on the line, Kilberg turns to psychotherapist Sophia Zetherland. Together, they expose a chain of shocking events that began dec decades ago. But will it lead them to the murderer before someone else dies? Um, and on the back it says, there's a fantastic twist from the Observer, which I'm always a little bit, hmm, let me discover the twist on my own, but you know, now I know there's a twist. Um, again, another one that the cover did draw me to it, and as a, an object, it's those kind of pages that make that kind of noise. That's, oh, oh. I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. So yeah, I was really drawn to this one. Um, it's been flying out the shop, so I thought, right, you know what, I'm gonna get myself a copy. So I'm gonna give this one a go soonish, I think. It is a bit of a chunkster, so I may read Starzy Wolf first, I don't know. Um, but this one is a crime novel I'm definitely gonna get around to soon. Then I bought, because I realised, with all my talk of Yuri Herrera, I was looking at my bookshelves, and I realised, somehow, I didn't have a copy of Signs Preceding the End of the World, which was outrageous. So, I think I just assumed I had it, and I know that I have picked up a copy and nearly read it a couple of times, so I don't quite know what's happened there. But I thought, you know what, having just read Kingdom Cons, I'm going to need to read Signs Preceding the End of the World sharpish. So I was like, right, if I can't find a copy, I'm just going to get another one. So I got another copy. So Signs Preceding the End of the World is one of the most arresting novels to be published in Spanish in the last ten years. Yuri Herrera does not simply write about the border between Mexico and the United States and those who cross it. He explores the crossings and translations people make in their minds and language as they move from one country to another, especially when there's no going back. Traversing this lonely territory is Makina, a young woman who knows only too well how to survive in a violent, macho world. Leaving behind her life in Mexico to search for her brother, she's smuggled into the US carrying a pair of secret messages. One from her mother and one from the Mexican underworld. Both of his previous novels, well, his previous novel, Transmigration of Body, and his upcoming novel, Kingdom Cons, have both got a sort of Mexican gangland slant to it. And there's something so magical in the way he writes that you end up reading a book about something that you wouldn't necessarily have thought you'd want to read a book about. So I am really excited to read this one. And it's going to happen soon. You know me. It's going to happen soon. Then I picked up a copy of The End We Start From by Megan Hunter, partly because look at this cover. Look at it in the shiny, shiny, shiny. Um, I've heard a lot about this one. It's a little slim novel. It's quite sparse. The text is sort of little snippets, so it looks like exactly my kind of thing. And it says, In the midst of a mysterious environmental crisis, as London is submerged between floodwaters, a woman gives birth to her first child, Z. Days later, the family are forced to leave their home in search of safety. As they move from place to place, shelter to shelter, their journey traces both fear and wonder, as Z's small fists grasp at the things he sees, as he grows and stretches, thriving and content against all the odds. This is a story of new motherhood in a terrifying setting, a familiar world made dangerous and unstable, its people forced to become refugees. Startlingly beautiful, The End We Start From is a gripping novel that paints an imagined future as realistic as it is frightening. And yet, though the country is falling apart around them, this family's world of new life and new hope sings with love. So I'm really excited about this one. I'm not a massive reader of hardbacks. Um, that was one question that I was surprised sort of wasn't in the reading habits tag, although I don't know why it would be. But anyway, in general, I struggle reading hardbacks unless they are sort of slim little ones. So it's it's a winner all round. And as I say, this cover, you've got sort of gold leaf of this um, flooded, flooded London. There's a couple of buildings in there, you know. Um, and what I love about a hardback when they get it right is it's got this gorgeous underneath... It's this gorgeous white and gold leaf, and I like it when a book underneath is a different colour to the end papers. So this one is published by Picador, and I am very excited to give it a read. It's got... I do... I don't always go by sort of the reviews on the back as to sort of how I'm going to feel about it, but it's got reviews on there from Emily St. John Mandel, and I loved Station Eleven, um, Rowan Hisao Buchanan, and I'm very excited for Harmless Like You, and from Sinan Jones, author of The Dig, and what was this other one that I read recently? Ooh. I can't remember the name of it. It was about a guy on a boat. Oh, I'll have to put that down below. But yeah, when it's got sort of, and Evie Wilde as well, I've just noticed, and I loved all the birds singing. So this one sounds like it's going to be firmly up my alley, and I think I'm going to read this one soon, probably 
when I finish I Hate the Internet, which is what I'm currently reading. So yeah, very excited for this one, The End We Start From by Megan Hunter. Then I picked up a couple of non-fiction, kind of more political titles. Now one is new and one is not so new. Um, the not so new one is Revolting, How the Establishment Are Undermining Democracy and What They're Afraid Of by Mick Hume. Now this one says, we live in strange days in the history of democracy. You can say that again, Mick. Every serious politician in the Western world supports it, yet when the EU referendum and American election both delivered the wrong result, elites challenged the merit of the people's will, and some even tried to block it. Preferring unelected institutions, from technocrats to the courts, self-appointed higher minds questioned whether voters are fit to be trusted with their own futures. And yet the answer will never be to impose limitations. Popular democracy must offer better choices rather than removing choice altogether. It's time to defend democracy and fight for more of it with no ifs, buts or backtracks. So this one looks really, really interesting. It's a nice little little one that I'm going to keep in my bag. And to go with it, that I thought would complement it quite well, I picked up a copy of Post-Truth, The New War on Truth and How to Fight Back by Matthew Dancona. Now, there's about three books out with the title Post-Truth at the moment. You've got this one by Matthew Dancona, and then there's one by Evan Davis, and there's one by someone else's name I've forgotten, which is really bad, but I'll put it down below, um, because it's very much a theme at the moment. Um, so I thought with all the, you know, election stuff going on, revolting, and post-truth would go quite nicely together. So the back of this one says, Welcome to the post-truth era, a time in which the art of the lie is shaking the very foundations of democracy. We are living in a new age in which clandestine technologies exploit big data and social media, manipulating, polarising and entrenching opinion. A climate has arisen where trust has evaporated, the authority of the media has wilted, and emotions matter more than facts. Award-winning journalist Matthew Dancona asks, How do we get here? And more importantly, how can we fight back? So... This one I'm going to dip in and out of quite soon. As I say, the two of them I think are quite well together, so I'm interested to tuck into those soon. Now the next one I picked up yesterday is James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Now you may remember a little while ago I spoke about the book version of I Am Not Your Negro, which I absolutely loved, and I picked up a copy of Another Country, which I haven't read yet. Now this one is a very slim little one, which is his impassioned plea to end the racial nightmare in America, and was a bestseller when it appeared in 1963, galvanising a nation and giving voice to the emerging civil rights movement. Told in the form of two intensely personal letters, The Fire Next Time is at once a powerful evocation of Baldwin's early life in Harlem and an excoriating condemnation of the terrible legacy of racial injustice. So I figured, again, to get into James Baldwin's writing, instead of diving straight into another country, having soaked in I Am Not Your Negro in, in the book form, I wanted to start with something a bit smaller, so this one came in the other day to the bookshop and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go for this one. Um, as it's only a little one, I think I am going to spend an evening with this very soon and read it and likely get very, very angry. Um, so yeah, James Baldwin's The Fire next time. Quite keen to get onto this one quickly. Then I picked up two very colourful books and I'm going to go for... Which one should I go for first? Ooh, ooh, choices. I'm going for this one. Gacha Gocha by Vivek Shambag. Now, you may have seen this one doing the rounds on Booktube, on Twitter and all sorts. A lot of people are very excited about this one. This one comes from Faber and Faber. And look at this cover. And look, I know people have shown this before. The end papers, you can't actually see it. And I'm, if I zoom in, it's going to take a week. It's actually loads of tiny, tiny ants. Tiny, tiny ants. When an impoverished but close-knit family undergoes an almost miraculous change in fortune, allegiances and desires realign, a marriage falls apart, and tensions build unstoppably towards a devastating conflict. In this transformative novel by the acclaimed Indian writer Vivek Shambhag, a family's unexpected ascent from an ant-infested shack, hence the ants, to middle-class living skillfully peels away the veneer of an aspirational society. The family's world becomes gacha gocha, a nonsense phrase that, to the restless, unnamed narrator of the book, comes to mean something entangled beyond repair. Told in clear, compelling prose and underscored by warmth and humour, Gacha Gocha is a captivating and unsettling story about the shifting meaning and consequences of financial gain in contemporary India. It is a fable for modern living that will resonate everywhere. So I'm quite excited to get onto this one again. It's another slim little hardback that people have been talking about so much that I am definitely, definitely going to get around to soon. And I know I seem to say that a lot in these videos, and I, I realised that I said, like, oh, I'm definitely going to get onto this one soon. If I got onto all of them soon, I would just drown in books. But I'm going to have a little hardback period I think with a couple of these slim ones that I've got having read um, Fever Dream which again another small concise very very impactful little hardback I'm going to give these a go so Vivek Shanbag's Gacha Gocha with this gorgeous cover nice design there Faber Faber always do a good book so yeah that one there very excited for where is that thesaurus 
So the last book that I picked up yesterday was The Gallows Pole by Benjamin Myers. Now, I have not read Beastings, though I have got a copy of it, and I've heard very, very good things about it. And I picked up a little while ago a copy of Turning Blue by Benjamin Myers, which is a sort of crime novel set in a contemporary world, and it's all to do with sort of... Uh, it's a lot of the sort of, like, Operation Yew Tree type crimes. And I struggled with that one to the point that I did give up on it, to be quite honest with you, but I think that was because... At the time, I didn't need that heaviness in my life, and I wasn't enjoying it, and I just thought... It wasn't his style of writing that put me off. His style of writing was really enjoyable, but it was just the subject matter was a bit too... For me, I just... Mm. So, this one, on the other hand, I've heard a lot about in this cover. Hello! Again, pink and, pink and greens, and it's almost exactly the same pink here as here. So... This one comes from Blue Moose Books, and I read... I think I've only ever read one from Blue Moose Books, which was the... something Don, Donna Cricklethwaite Life and something or other. It's got a really long title, and I can never remember it, about a girl who lives in a house covered in books and dresses up as a knight with, like, frying pans and stuff. I can't remember, but I did quite enjoy that one. Um, so this one says, An England Divided. From his remote moorland home, David Hartley assembles a gang of weavers and land workers to embark upon a criminal enterprise that will capsize the economy and become the biggest fraud in British history. They are the Crag Vale coiners, and their business is clipping. The forging of coins, a treasonous offence punishable by death. A charismatic leader, Hartley cares for the poor and uses violence and intimidation against his opponents. He is also prone to self-delusion and strange visions of mythical creatures. When excise officer William Dayton vows to bring down the coiners and one of their own becomes turncoat, Hartley's empire begins to crumble. With the industrial age set to change the face of England forever, the fate of this empire is under threat. Forensically assembled from historical accounts and legal documents, the Gallows Pole is a true story of resistance that combines poetry, landscape, crime and historical fiction whose themes continue to resonate. Here is a rarely told alternative history of the North. Now I'm quite excited about this one because I think the history of the North in general and let's not get two Games of Thrones jokey here. The history of the North gets swallowed up and forgotten a lot in terms of sort of London history and Southern history and, and all of this. So, And it's not a period of history that I know anything about, really. I had no idea about these coiners who I've since read basically very nearly crippled the British economy at the in, in its infancy. And he was sort of like a Robin Hood character, but he was larger than life and a little bit nuts and not sort of cut and paste either way, so I'm really intrigued by this one. So I'm going to give this one a go because I love, as I say, I love that the cover almost sort of harks back to some of these old style covers, um, and it just looks really, really fascinating, and having had a little flick through, which I don't do often, but having had a flick through and seeing the kind of writing, again, it's a similar style to, to Turning Blue, and that's what drew me to that one. Whereas it's not a subject matter that I'm going to be so kind of freaked out by and not need in my life. So this one I'm very excited about. And also there's a character in here called Broadbent and I'm going to see him as Jim James Broadbent all the way through. Do I mean James Broadbent? Jim Broadbent. Who do I mean? The guy from The Borrowers and Slughorn. Oh, forgetting everything. But anyway, this book. Yeah. Quite excited for this one. Again. Thesaurus, Livy. So yeah, that's what I've bought in the first part of May so far. I'm probably going to have picked up some more books even by the time this one goes up because that's just who I am. Um, oh, I've forgotten one more that I do want to mention quickly. Bear with. Actually, it might be two more because I'm not sure if I hold this one. So this is Simon Armitage, New Cemetery. Now, I have to confess that I'm not the biggest fan of Simon Armitage's poetry. Now, I think that is simply because through all my studies of poetry, it was he was kind of one of the first ones and it was kind of shoved down your throat a bit too much. And I think I've got Simon Armitage fatigue, but... This one looks absolutely fantastic, and it's not just... Well, okay, it's mainly the format of the book that drew me to it. It's this gorgeous black hardback with these maps, and the format of the poetry here is just... You've got these little, little illustrations here. Am I even getting this in? No, I am. And it's just absolutely stunning. And I love books, in particular with poetry, that combines the physical form on the page with design to create something magical. So this one I am going to spend an evening with and I'm going to give Simon Armitage another chance and I think, you know, I need to be, I need to let go of some of these hang-ups. So this one I'm very excited about. Now the one I wanted to mention is kind of cheating because I've already got a copy and I've already read it and you've seen it around, but it's also not because... Paperback copy of Cain by Luke Kennard. I'm so happy. So I don't often 
buy myself like a hardback copy and a paperback copy. Copy? Copy. But I loved Kane so much that I do want to keep the hardback copy, copy, ah, the hardback copy, nice and safe and pristine. And if I'm ever possibly going to get uh, get to see Luke Kennard at a signing or anything, I will get that one signed and that one will stay and I will love it. But I also want a paperback copy that I can bash around, keep in my bag, because I genuinely, I love this one so much that I want to read these episodes of, of, of Kane again, the anagrams, and I just, I absolutely adored this, this poetry, this poetry book. Um, I don't know whether you know that, but I don't know whether I've mentioned it enough times. So yeah, I just wanted to haul this one as well and give another shout out to Luke Kennard because this is absolutely fantastic. As I said before, when I spoke about this book, I have read some of his previous poetry collections and I have got on my shelf over here, The Transition, which is his novel, published by Fourth Estate earlier this year, or late last year, um, which I'm really excited to read soon, and just a massive fan, so go and check this one out. Now that it's out in paperback, should be in all good branches of Waterstones. Um, if not, just get your hands on this one, because I promise you it's wonderful. So yeah, that is my haul for the first part of May. Now I think, I may be wrong, but I think I've gone this whole video without accidentally calling my haul a wrap-up. Look at that, growth. I'm developing as a booktuber. Look at that, look at that. As per usual, if any of these books here that you can't actually see, but you can hear me tapping the top, if any of the books that I've mentioned in this video look like they are your kind of thing or intrigue you or float your boat, let me know. Again, if you've read any of them and you don't like them, just hold off, don't tell me that now, don't tell me that now. If you like the look of any of these, if anyone's read any of these and loved them, tell me have a little chat with me in the comments below and again i will pop all of the relevant business down below and i will see you for my next video